we'll start with a very basic question. What is your name? Uh, my name is Peter Abbott. And where are you from? I live in Milwaukee now. I'm from New York originally. And uh, when did you attend the University of Wisconsin-Madison? From 19, fall of 64 to January of 69. So why did you choose to come to UW from New York? Was it, uh, was, what attracted you? Oh, uh, well, I had a friend who went here, who started going here two years before me. She was like my closest friend. And so that was, um, made it my number two choice. My first choice was Berkeley, but um, my parents objected me to going that far from New York. So we compromised on the middle of the country and I wound up in Madison. Um, that's basically it. And what did you study when you were at UW? Well, I was in the ILS program to start with, um, uh, but I quickly chose history as my major. I thought it would be a good background for a future career in journalism so I could understand better what I, what I was reporting on. And um, in the second semester of my sophomore year, I took my first, or it was the first semester as my elective while I was in ILS, was uh, George Mossy's uh, introduction, European history, introduction to European history. And that's, uh, I was totally impressed the first minute he started talking. You know, I think he says, I'm here to uh, destroy your illusions or, or uh, your slogans, one or the other. And uh, he went through the uh, slogans he was destroying, which was, uh, the first was the idea that this is a democracy, it's not, it's representative government. And um, the other one, I forgot what the other one is offhand. I'll remember people, it tomorrow, maybe. but what? The people. Oh yes, exactly. Uh, the other illusion is uh, the people. Uh, there is no the people. The question is, which people are you talking about? Yeah. And so, um, I was zeroed in, focused in right away from there. Was that the only course with Mossy that you took? Or did you take no, I took four semesters. I took the two semesters of the introduction and then two semesters of European cultural history. Um, so that was, uh, and then, but in the introductory course, um, I was selected along with Lucy Cooper as one of those who would be, um, instead of having a TA, we would, uh, it was a group specifically with him as our, as our TA in effect. And that was uh, quite a thing too. It's where, um, growing up in the United States, I didn't have the full sense of what anti-Semitism was like. And I remember during that course, he made a passing reference to the blood libel. And we all looked at each other like, what is that? He says, he says you don't know what the blood libel is? Oh, you innocents. And he explained it to us. And um, I got a, fuller sense of what it was like to be Jewish in an anti-Semitic country where you're only 1% of the population or less, as opposed to growing up in New York where we're, if not a majority, certainly large enough to have a you know, major role in the life of New York. So it was a whole different world he was coming from, and which my parents, and, or my mother and her parents had come from. Where did, you, where did your mother come from? Vienna, Austria. Uh, and she was also, but they moved around. They had also spent some time in Berlin. In fact, she and her parents were in Berlin at, for Kristallnacht. And uh, she talked about how um, one day she was going to school, playing with classmates, Jewish and non-Jewish. The next day, the classmates she'd been playing with, when she walked down the street, would cross to the other side to avoid her. Same kids, next day. And uh, that's when she knew they were going to have to leave. Did you get involved with the student movement? Oh, yeah. As an undergrad? How did that right. come about, and what was the extent Well, of actually, I was involved in high school. In high school, I joined the Young People's Socialist League and the Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, we went on a, a, a chapter of CORE was um, uh, a socialist got, got involved in, uh, in East Harlem. We went, went door to door trying to organize a tenants union. And so I was already active before I even got there. Um, there was a Yipsol chapter in Madison, not very big, and I joined that. Over the years that went on, I gradually drifted away from it because they moved too far to the right while I was moving leftward. Um, so, and so I was involved at first with civil rights support work, and then as the Vietnam War heated up, particularly after Johnson's election, I got involved mostly in anti-war work. Uh, all the demonstrations that were involved. I was also 
But my principal involvement was with the Daily Cardinal there outside of the classroom. Spent many hours working on that, reporting on everything, not just protests, but you know, student government, the life and dorm life there. Did so, you know Joel Brenner? Oh, sure. He was the one who beat me out for the editorship. Really? I still resent him for that. <laughs> because he had only worked there for a short time, and I had been there ever since, for the first day of my freshman year, I walked into the Daily Cardinal and uh, started working for it. He came in late, he'd only been there for a year, and he got the job because he lobbied well with the Cardinal board. Do you know that he was the head of counterintelligence under Bush too? We won't use this, we can cut this off. I had <laughs> no idea. Shocking, oh dear. The only thing I knew afterwards is that he worked for Proxmire. Yeah. Oh, well. Wow. Yeah. I'll have to look him up. Joel Brenner. But there's probably a lot of Joel Brenners. How do I narrow it down for the Google search? Well, he was in touch with us about taking the course. So oh. maybe we could put you in touch yeah. with him. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. If you're interested. Yes, yeah, sure. I'm more interested in my editor, when I was the news editor there in my junior year, was Eileen Alt who became Eileen Alt Powell, married another reporter, John Powell. And uh, I had more of a relationship with her friends, and uh, I was more impressed with her. And she had quite a career afterwards as well. A world, a globe-trotting journalist. As a student, did you see like an interplay between the journalistic work that you were doing and the history courses? Or was, did you, only in the, when I was covering the anti-war protests, really. Um, and it was not just Mossy's course, of course, but Goldberg's course, because he was more directly involved with it, but Mossy was too. Um, he gave his opinions and he supported the anti-war. He thought we should get involved more in electoral politics, supporting peace candidates, like somebody who was running for governor at the time. Um, David Carley. Uh, he was the peace candidate, even though he was just running for governor. Oddly how things turn out, though, um, when Robert Kennedy became the anti-war candidate for uh, president, David Carley supported Hubert Humphrey because the more liberal wing of the party originally was more associated with Humphrey, the more moderate wing with John Kennedy. And so they switched sides because they kept their personal ties regardless of their position on the war. So. Uh, the Kennedy people stuck with Kennedy and were anti-war, and they, so were the pro-Humphrey people, but they stuck with Humphrey, you know? Uh, personal connections make a big, bigger difference. That's something I learned following that. Per, personal animus, personal friendships have more to do with where you wound up politically aligned than your positions on the issues. Interesting. Uh, how did your Madison experience then influence your career? Um, my, well, my Madison experience, particularly with the Daily Cardinal, influenced my career because I went on to, into journalism, off and on, but also I learned, and my mother is an artist too, as well as my grandmother, and uh, had an artistic bent, I think I may have inherited, and I got involved in layout and page layout as well as the journalistic side, so I pursued a career first in journalism, and then when I got back to Milwaukee, uh, I, uh, my friend who was a photographer and another friend who was an artist, the three of us formed a, a graphic arts company. I was to be the writer, but I, I pursued the graphic side of it as well, the graphic design side. So uh, between then and now, um, I've been variously employed and unemployed in two careers, journalism and graphic arts. So what was the history department like in those years? Was it did you take courses with William Appleman Williams? Yes, or? I did, with Aunt Williams and Goldberg and William O'Neill. I thought, again, pursuing the journalistic background idea, I thought I should more focus on American history, so I took William O'Neill, and he was my faculty advisor. Um, and um, and I, I took Williams and Goldberg and Mossy, and I think I took something in um, diplomatic history from somebody named Sell, I think. I think it was Soviet foreign policy. I think it focused on that. And Sen? Was it Sen? Sen, yes. Right. Right. That's <coughs> oh, it sounds really... 
great education. That's what yeah, I, um, I'm so, I have, one of my regrets is that I might have pursued an academic career, but I decided I had to leave. I had to get involved in the real world. That's why I, so I joined VISTA and became a VISTA volunteer. For those of you who don't know, that's uh, like the Domestic Peace Corps. And they assigned me to Milwaukee. And I thought I needed to get involved in the real world. And as long as I was in Madison, and I thought the, the far left had gotten kind of loony. And, um, and I thought it was like an incubator of insanity to be in that bubble in Madison. So. I was glad to go to Milwaukee and see how my ideas would work out in the real world, not just against competing ideologies in Madison. So, um, and the first thing I got involved with besides uh, Vista once I got there was the Great Boycott. Somebody I knew, a socialist I knew in Madison, had gone up to Watoma and had organized Obreros Unidos, a farm workers union, and then he came to Milwaukee. So the success of the local union depended on the success of the Great Boycott. And I ran into him at the Spanish Center because I was assigned to the South Side by the Milwaukee Public Library, my sponsor. I said, hey, Peter, you know, so we're trying to get together a house of people, you know, so we can all share the rent. And so I moved in with him and we we're involved with the Great Boycott and that became Solidarity House, which in turn was across the back alley from uh, the Casa Maria Hospitality House, uh, who were also involved in anti-war activities. So that was my initiation in Milwaukee. So Peter, were you here when Father Grappi was active and all of that, those demonstrations? Just a little bit later, but we used to take trips to Milwaukee, Lucy Cooper and I, who was my girlfriend at the time. Um, we used to come up to Milwaukee to participate in the marches, Father Grappi's marches. After I got here, those were over, but I got, um, became friends with Dismas Becker, who had been a participant in those marches and was another priest, in fact, although he left the priesthood like Grappi did and got married, like Rabbi did. But at the time, he was not only, he became leader of the welfare rights movement and was in Madison, led the, the, um, the takeover of the state capitol in Madison, got beaten by police. Um, and, uh, well, and he was one of the people I most admired in Milwaukee. He later um, moved on to electoral politics and became the majority leader for the Democrats in the state assembly and uh, was a member of uh, DSOC at the time and DSA, what we know as DSA now, when it merged with NAM, the New American Movement. And um, it was great to have a majority leader of the state assembly as a member of the, our local socialist group here. Especially one that had taken it over at one time. As, <laughs> that's extraordinary. Yeah. That was quite an event. That takeover of the state yes. capitol? Yes, yeah, it was. was Amazing week in he had went along with the majority. He had actually had a, Dismas had actually advised against it because he thought if you're taking over the seat of government, that's revolution, and we're not really ready for that. You know, it's not a good idea at this time. Uh, but the group went, so he went, and um, the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, I don't think most people realize what it was like here in Milwaukee in those years and what that confrontation meant to the city, to the establishment here, to the African-American community. I, mm -hmm. I think that's a history that we're not that familiar with here in Wisconsin. Right. It turns out that my work with the graphic arts company I mentioned, major, our clients were mainly local anti-poverty agencies and the who had, and the staff of that had come out of the civil rights movement, basically, not only in the African American community, but in the Latino community. So, which I was more directly involved with because um, I was one of the uh, group that founded LaGuardia, which is the um, bilingual Latin American community newspaper, it was then at the time. Uh, the founders were Lala Valdez and Roberto Hernandez. Uh, so, there was a unity of the Puerto Rican and Mexican American communities, which didn't exist in a lot of other cities. And um, I was there for technical uh, expertise in both graphic arts and journalism. I wrote some of the articles and I laid out the paper. So, um, and pasted it up and showed them where what materials they needed to buy, you know, all those press on letters for headlines, you know, and then we got typesetting equipment and I would do the t some of the typesetting. 
So, um, so that was uh, a big part of it too. Um, and so I was, again, then we went on to the, after Vista and LaGuardia, I was involved in, like I said, in the graphic arts uh, company. And we were working for these agencies who came out of the civil rights movement. And that was, and as a result of that, I then got involved more with the African American community because some of our clients were there and we used some of their printing. Uh, there was a printer called Precious Baldwin. And we used some of her, uh, we, she was a, a vendor for us. And, um, and that led to more connections with the, uh, there was a bar called Tarange, I think. Tarans or Tarange. Um, which was like a community center at the time. And then I remember uh, we did a, uh, there was a fundraiser, a football team, football game fundraiser, and we did the uh, program book for it, and the back page was two of the most prominent members of the black community who owned a funeral home, uh, Terrence and Orville Pitts, and there had a third partner named Graves. So there it was, a funeral, Pitts, Pitts and Graves funeral home. So I thought it was the, the great names in, in Milwaukee, yeah. Milwaukee community. That's great. I was wondering if they knew what it sounded like, yeah. but they probably did. So do you think your experiences in Madison really shaped your subsequent uh, commitment to, well, we could say social justice, or was that something that you that came from your family background? Did the combination of the two really resonate? I think it came, mo it came mostly from my family background, from growing up in New York, where there were so many, I remember my first political action was, uh, I went to a SANE rally in 1961, when I was all of 14, uh, at Madison Square Garden. A friend of mine, Mark Schaefer, said, I'm going, you know, I want to come with, I said, sure. And uh, my parents were all behind it, you know, they're all for it. As a matter of fact, I remember one of my first political um, talks from my mother came when we were in the car listening to the radio, and there was one of these um, air raid drills, and there were protesters out, you know, defying it by going out into the streets and saying, no, we're not going underground, we're not going into a local subway station, we're coming out and saying this is a, just a mentality preparing us for war, you know. I said, those people are crazy, don't they? They learned a lesson in the world of Pearl Harbor, and you know, they've got to be prepared. And my mother explained all what, what they were doing and why that was, you know, the, this was baloney, the every drill's baloney. They were just saying, they were trying to normalize war or an upcoming war. And um, so that began my political thinking, actually, was from that conversation. Let's jump to the class a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> How did you hear about the, the online class? Well, actually it was from my wife. She got an email or something in the mail, I forget which, and she said, look. And she had gone to, she was like two years behind me in Madison, and she had taken Goldberg, but not Mossy. Uh, and uh, at that time, Mossy had somewhat of a bad reputation among the left. Um, and so she didn't take him. Um, he was somewhat misogynistic. He had, I remember one in one of our classes as saying, there's been no great artist or writer who was a woman, you know, or not where it's said better, but um, the same basic effect, you know, cultural history is a male, is a male pursuit. And um, I, not being that educated on it at the time, just thought that was just a little side thing, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, my wife, so my wife had t heard me talk about Mossy and Lucy talk about her, him and, and uh, her importance to us. And so when she saw that the course was available online, she brought it to our attention and also said we should organize a study group around it. So that was all her idea. So, and I think that was really, because one thing I wanted, one thing that attracted me to take the course was not just the nostalgia for it or my wife's uh, interest in it, but because of what it was happening with the Trump election and the rise of white nationalism here, I thought I needed to get back in touch with, you know, a better, deeper understanding of it. So I took the course with that in mind, and I thought it was great we had a study group because then our discussions could be around its relevance for today's politics and what, how that might inform our actions in response to it. Were there particular lectures or readings that helped with that conversation or that stand out to you now? 
Hmm. Um, I would say the the citations from the novels, the going through the the uh, even the, especially the soft core anti-Semitism that provided the backdrop for that softened people up and opened people up for the hardcore Nazi stuff later on, um, and then relating that to like the soft core bigotry of American anti-black racism and how that provide some of the background noise for the hardcore stuff. Um, the I'm not a racist but kind of stuff. Um, and like I said, also particularly, um, it, and what's one, of the, uh, one of the members, Art Heitzer, particularly wanted us to focus on what we could do now or how it could help us understand how we could uh, combat racism in the US today. And like I've mentioned to you before, the uh, that uh, Richard Spencer um, uh, victory speech, hail Trump, hail victory, um, and then seeing it again on YouTube after taking the course made me realize how deep, see, how connected that was to what I had been reading um, because I didn't really connect it until the, the course. Um, clearly Spencer is well read in his fascist history. Um, and not much on anything else, though. Not much on anything else. So it reminded me that the conventional wisdom, you know, that progressives should focus on, you know, economic issues because we can't take on the culture, which is, you know, cultural battleground is, tilts against us, while well, the economic ground tilts for us. And it ain't enough. That ain't going to work. Because the e emotions of the cultural appeal will trump the economic appeal every time. Not to coin a pun there. Yeah. Uh, how did the did the class then change or deepen your understanding of racism and anti-Semitism? Well, actually, I thought. Um, well, one thing I th thought a couple of well a couple of things there. Um, it deepened it because I learned about how racism is so can be run so deep that you don't even have to have a race; you can just make it up. You know, as in making it up that Jews are a race, you know, because in the absence of, uh, of the Africans in Europe, they had to make up a darker race. Um, and you couldn't use Italians because they were allies, so because they were fascists even before Hitler, so or before uh, Hitler's rise. So um, Jews were the stand in, and also they were vulnerable. They were, like you said, like the course show, I didn't realize they were only 0.75% of the population, um, which makes it, and also there's a, therefore is a difference. There's also part of the course told us that instant recognition was important. So they had to make up, you know, all the common racial characteristics, the big nose, you know, the hairy body, the short stature, the disproportion. The, and they had to make it all up so you could see three people through that prism, even though they didn't match that look. Um, in, a, in a way, American racism is both harder and easier. Harder because African Americans are a bigger part of the population and have more white supporters. Um, and in part, but it's uh, also easier because there is instant recognition for, of most African Americans in this country. Um, so that, that informed my understanding of it, too. Um, but also, uh, Art Heitzer did add some things to it in terms of emphasizing the structural nature of racism in this country. And I think in this country, the structural racism came first. Slavery came, and, and, and the ideology came as a way of rationalizing the, uh, the slavery and the Jim Crow and, and slavery by another name through the prison system and mass incarceration today. Um, the, so, and then also there's the question of religion because like I said, I've discussed with you before that there's a thinner line between religion and racial anti-Semitism and and uh, racism, there's always been 
I mean, the, you know, the slave owners and the Confederacy were all good Christians, so were the abolitionists, you know. And there's also a line in Mossy's, one of Mossy's books about, when he goes through all these novels and so forth, says, yet the parish priest preaching anti-Semitism, even though it wasn't racial anti-Semitism, probably had more effect than popular novels. And I also think that there's another, that it also, religious anti-Semitism, while it did leave the out of conversion or baptism, still softened people up for the racial anti-Semitism. So it was easy to transpose from one to the other, especially with the influence of the parish priest, whether either a parish priest or minister either on the Protestant or on the Catholic side of the line in Germany. Some of the mechanics of the, the study group. You guys met on Sundays? Well, yeah, we met on weekends because at least one of us has to work every day, and that was my wife. And we met, so we met on weekends. We met on, first we met at uh, Art and Sandy's house, um, and then we met a, a, once or twice at my house. I'll turn this off. And uh, so that was a very congenial atmosphere. Um, we didn't meet Rusty until the dinner, uh, but we're glad we did, because we, we appreciated his comments online, which we thought were among the most insightful. Um, so we had a discussion, we had a debate about the importance of economic, political economy versus culture. Um, I prefer the, um, the multi-causal approach that Mossy sometimes talked about, although I think he gave short shrift to the political economy over culture. Um, I think you have to take it partly, you know, sometimes one is more dominant, sometimes the other is, and you have to appreciate, you know, not apply your analysis first and then look at the reality afterwards. You look at the reality and, and let uh, the broader uh, understanding coming from both analyses these uh, apply to it, but you look and see, you know, which is predominant in the situation. You let the reality determine your outlook as much as the uh, analysis you bring to it. Uh, I'm right now reading uh, Mossy's autobiography, Confronting History, and he talks, I'm like a quarter of the way through it, but talks about his complicated relationship to Zionism. I want to read more about that because I remember in one of the, in the Cornell lecture, he talked about the settler moving it, movement as having racist uh, aspects to it. And so I'm not the Zionist he was. Um, I used to call myself a Zionist, but not anymore. Um, so I'm wondering what, what conclusions he came to as, as he evolved. Well, you know, I was thinking about um, the resonance of that one lecture where he talks about the divisions in the Jewish community right. and how that made them so vulnerable to mm -hmm. Nazi exploitation and persecution. And it carried with them to the, the concentration camps with yes. the same divisions of the religious, the non-religious, the liberals, the communists, and yes. socialists. and. And I think that probably was the origin of his Zionism. Not only what happened in the oh. war, because before the war, his family, he was anti-Zionist. Mm -hmm. anti and he was, in some ways, trying to flee his Jewishness, in a way. But it was mm -hmm. really the, the experience of the war and um, the post-war period and the founding of Israel, because he went there right mm -hmm. after the state was founded. Uh, but I think it was that sense of solidarity and... Uh, his family wasn't just anti-Zionist, they were also anti-socialist and anti cop One of his left-wing sister, when she said she was voting for the Social Dem Democrats, her, her father was horrified. Yeah. Their father was horrified. Yeah, well, they were liberals. They were liberals. They were, you know, they had the real belief in progress and all of that. Positivism, yeah. You know, ideology. The Liberal Party was so inept, though. Yeah. They also, because I got this, I took another, the other professor I took was Richard Hamilton, the political sociologist, and he talked about the evolution of that party in particular. They had stopped camp campaigning in rural areas. They, in Germany. In Germany. Yeah. They um, took on, and they, they merged with a paramilitary group, so because every party had to have one, and they changed their name to the state party. 
So whatever followers they had around the country, especially outside of urban centers, would go to the ballot box, go to the polling place looking for the old party name and it wasn't there. So they had to look for somebody else. You know, whereas the Nazis were campaigning in the countryside, and he gave an example where one side of the street only voted for the Nazis because the, uh, the, the, the motorcycle brigade just went up one side of the street. They wanted to try to cover as much ground as possible. They only talked to people on one side of the street, and that side voted Nazi. The other side voted for whoever they used to vote for. So the other parties didn't campaign, yeah. you know, but especially the Liberal Party. They changed their name. They took on it. They became, called themselves the State Party because the fascist side of the equation were, were elevating the state as this, you know, as the embodiment of the nation. And so uh, they changed their name. To, so they, they were erasing the distinctions they had between themselves and the, the far right, yeah. the statist right. Yeah. I'm not sure uh, Mossy calls himself sometimes, going back to Zionism, a cautious Zionist, sometimes hmm. an optimistic Zionist, sometimes an idealistic and sometimes Zionism. a liberal Zionist. Or Zionism of the of the heart is yeah. what he you know it, it's that question like of the left in Israel now that is so alienated from the state and yet are still convinced Zionists in the sense that they serve in the army. Mm. They really are the backbone of that culture, and yet they're totally alienated from their government. Well, the and army you itself. You don't see that here. I mean, you don't see. Americans on, on the left volunteering to be, you know, no. officers in the military on the front line, and so that—that's, I mean, that commitment I think comes up. I remember the invasion that led to the Six Day War. My friend Michael Kaplan and I were talking about going over there and volunteering. You knew you Michael. Know? You know Michael. Sure. Yeah. Oh, he's he's someone we're very much in touch with. He still, I, I would oh, like yeah. to be in touch with him too. Okay. He and I. Yeah, he's, there was a left-wing student political party, UCA. He was on the top of the ticket as the presidential candidate. I was the vice presidential candidate. The year before, the, when the party was founded by Freddie Saporn and John Coltsworth, uh, Lucy Cooper was the vice presidential candidate. In fact, led the ticket because the presidential candidate was a nice guy, but he, when we were having events, he would be out in the kitchen talking to the workers back there, you know, not talking to the people who are gonna vote, you know. <laughs> So he was like a non-factor, but Lucy was a dynamo. So, gosh, we have to... I, I can show you a picture on my phone later if you want. I have a picture of a po campaign poster with me and Michael Kaplan yeah, on absolutely. it. Can you, can you send, send that to us? Email. Sure. Yeah, send that to Scott. Send email, yeah. We'll send it to Michael. He was in Ypsil too until the national group came and met with us and met, had its na a national committee meeting then, and they were so, they were pro-war, it turned out in the Vietnam War, and that we all had to leave, but you know, he left, you know, he was just appalled. And I was too, I left later, uh, because I knew all these people, so I had some personal ties with them, but you know, I drifted away, because it was just, they were off the wall, you know. Yeah, he funded a prize at, in the history department. Wow, Michael yeah, did? He did, yeah, he's a big supporter. We were close friends until that, and then we, by the time we were campaigning, I think I was still a member, and, but he had drifted, he had quit, and, uh, but we both campaigned at UCA, and he used to yipsel bait me every once in a while. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll show you the picture. I'll send you the, I'll email you the picture. Um, as far as history as a tool for understanding what's going on today and informing my political actions today, I mean, one, another book that I read, as I mentioned earlier, was Goldberg's biography of Jean Jaurès, and I was looking at the debates they were having then, and those were, and, they, and they're having the same debates today as they were having then about um, uh, Clemenceau, when they were, uh, Jerez was success eventually successfully campaigning for separation of church and state to get the church out of the public schools. Um, Clemenceau is debating against this. Says now, God. Then, if you take God out of the classroom, then God will be the state. You know, I thought that was an interesting argument. You know, um, but there were other arguments about how uh, socialists supposedly would be the uh, the status who would suppress freedom, but look who's suppressing freedom today. It's the forces of the right, the monarchy, the church, and the, uh, I'm leaving one out, the monarchy, the church, 
and the old, well, the old aristocracy and the business community, of course. You know, they were the ones who were uh, standing on the other side of, of the liberation of the working class from their poverty. So um, this was uh, this is an interesting debate. I think it had great relevance today, you know, and I was interested in, I have to go back over Jorez's arguments on the other side. Uh, I think it affects, you know, the liberals of today as well because they're basically on the social democratic side of the debate. And the, uh, the cultural side of the debate is similar. You know, we don't have the monarchy or the, uh, we do have re the religious right. Um, we don't have an aristocracy, but we do have a corporate aristocracy who are accumulating every ounce of economic growth into their own coffers. Um, but it also reminds me that the cultural debate sometimes trumps it. Now, of course, there's a lot of money behind that to make it uh, the uh, dominant debate. To, uh, today, I, I've always thought until Trump um, that the swing vote was not some sort of moderate vote that's taking some from column A or some from column B. They really they do that, but it's really the populist, it's really a populist swing vote. And if they swing on cultural issues, they'll turn right. If they swing on economic justice issues, they'll turn left. And I said, not just economics, because talk about lunch bucket issues, just how much money is taken out of or put into your pocket is not enough. You have to make it, you have to need the moral messaging to make it a cultural issue as well. And uh, so, um, the, and the only way for the left to win is to unite a cultural, moral message with the economic issue. So it's not just about materialism, it's about justice. And, um, or not so much just about identity politics yeah. and, and that, those kind right. of divisions. And yeah, but that's sort of a, basically we have white identity politics, yes. you know, that is really running rampant no, right now. Exactly. And some of what's called identity politics, I think, is kind of a smear because it's really about justice politics, mm -hmm. you know. But that's how that, well, perception has to be countered by the left in an effective right. way to make it a, a, a more uh, Because and, and to, so, to defend identity politics rather than saying, no, it's not just identity politics, it's about justice politics. Mm -hmm. Right. It's another way of putting it. Yeah. Well, we should Reframing it, as yeah. George Lakich would say.